different topic. It's just like the whole, the whole talk about this. The whole festival could be better. Okay. So, hopefully now that your minds are fully dialed into yourselves, your stories, where you source your own capacity. We're gonna start talking about some big, big themes, big topics. So the title of this talk is Psychedelics for Restoration, Reparations, and Regeneration. So we're gonna go into those words a little bit because they can mean different things to different people. And the really big question I think here especially is what the heck do psychedelics have to do with it? What exactly are we talking about? You heard a little bit of our origin stories and the extent to which these substances have been utilized by us or others, maybe many of you, to kind of crystallize that process in your own heart and mind. But how exactly do we step outside of that? So much of the theme of the festival that I've seen so far, and I just want to give so much credit to the organizers and to the people who've been curating content for it, is that so much of the theme here, yeah, can we give it actually yeah. round of applause? I'm so grateful, it's been such a liberatory experience. And so much of what I've heard over and over and over again in all these different ways is, you're all here, we're all here in this amazing, beautiful, next level, superstar, co-created space. The sacred space. And we're all gonna go home tonight or tomorrow or the next day soon. And we're back in the matrix out there, which is also here, but out there. <laughs> so, I want to talk a little bit about how these experiences we've been having can translate out into that world and how themes and ideas that are happening that are crystallizing out there that we also see here on the dance floor in the speeches and the talks etc everywhere and how those things can kind of be amplified based in part on what you just spent some time on your origin story where you come from what is your offering that's the that's the link all these ideas, they're all gonna come out of where you are. So let's start with this first idea of restoration. Restoration, to restore. To start, you have to have something to restore it to. And there's an implication there that something has been taken or lost. So I wanna talk a little bit about restoration. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what is it to you? and what do psychedelics have to do with it? Thank you for asking. Um, so, how many of you all know what the UN DRIP stands for? Oh, I see, I see a hand, amazing. Okay, so by the end of this uh, talk, we're gonna have to know what the UN DRIP is. So the UN DRIP is the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Rights, of Indigenous Rights People. Uh, I don't know if I got that right, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so anyways, um, the UN DRIP it, are the blueprints for processes of restoration, reparation, and regeneration. regeneration. Um, and so if we all read the UN DRIP in the next month, annotate it, write it up, really see where uh, international bodies are in violation of the UN DRIP, we then are able to see what our role might be in ensuring that it's enforced. And for me, that's really what restoration means. It's really analyzing and deconstructing what uh, is in violation, what has been in violation for centuries, and diagnosing. You know, using this as a blueprint to diagnose and really um, understand that it's up to us to enforce it. So, you know, we're here at this festival. I started coming here when I was 17 years old and this is the first time there has been anything like this here this is the first time i see talks um for doing spiritual justice work for black lives and i just want to give a shout out that's been so powerful thank you thank you adorable angel. so restoration means we identify what we're in violation of and so i just wanted to take this time to read a little bit from the un trip and encourage you all to read it there's no way we're going to get through this and there's so many things to talk about so um, for regeneration, recognizing that respect for indigenous knowledge, cultures, and traditional practices contributes 
to sustainable and equitable development and proper management of the environment. Um, so I can, can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. I'll slow down. It needs to be said twice. Okay. Recognizing that respect for indigenous knowledge, cultures, and traditional practices contributes to sustainable and equitable development and proper management of the environment. Woo! And to piggyback off of Ismail's talk on the Psychedelic New Deal, um, which is uh, an, a seed that was sprouted from, uh, from the Green New Deal, which was inspired by the New Deal, and one of the pillars of the Green New Deal is um, indigenous, upholding indigenous rights. And that also has to be an integral pillar of the psychedelic New Deal. So because um, some psychoactives have been in use for centuries and were actually prohibited during the processes of colonization, especially in the Northern Triangle where my matrilineal lineage is from, um, I think it's integral that mushrooms, indigenous to Mesoamerica, be used in the process of demilitarizing um, demilitarizing Central America and other places um, with similar uh, challenges with um, open air prisons and continuation of colonialism. So um, there's a lot. And there's also um, the fact that we've continued to um, incarcerate uh, indigenous youth and separate them from families, and that's in violation of another article of the UN DRIP. And so we think about uh, regenerative work as also um, really prioritizing that we don't fuck up more youth's lives and recognize that the boarding schools that were implemented here, the family separation that happened during the slave trade, if we recognize that that is still happening right now and that we really, like, we should really leave this festival and literally go to fucking detention centers and escort kids and people out of there, like, that is what regeneration is because we must do the work for the next seven generations. And part of the just transition, uh, which is a transition from a, a fossil fuel economy to a renewable energy economy is gonna take so many people. So really um, investing in processes that give everyone work to do, um, that sustains their lives, and um, ensuring that psychedelics are part of the process. Like how the hell are we gonna have conversations between people who have been harmed beyond belief at the front lines of state violence and those who have perpetuated the most grotesque acts of torture. What are our options? And I feel like psychedelics is, is the way. And especially there have been conflict resolution ceremonies that have involved psychedelics as part of our cultural inheritance to reclaim that, at least from the Northern Triangle. I can speak a little bit more, especially to this conflict, conflict resolution piece. So last year I went to a conference called Plantas Sagradas de las Americas, Sacred Plants of the Americas. It was in Mexico. Um, and it was exactly what it sounds like. And there I learned that in Colombia, which is where my mom's family is from, the threat to the indigenous people of that land were not just from the government, but also from the cartels. So in parts of the country where there really wasn't a state oversight body or at least a legitimate one, the few places that were not overrun previously by colonialism and by the new Colombian government and by the Colombian government as, it's, as it was currently standing was many parts of that were taken over also by the cartels in the early 60, or 60s, 70s in the process of developing the current cocaine trade network that we're aware of, kind of coming out of Colombia and Bolivia and other countries in that area. And I learned that one of the interesting things that's been happening since the truce, the peace treaty in Colombia, which was two and a half years ago, shaky truce, but in theory still going, was that because there was this active process of demilitarization of all three sides of the civil war, which raged for 52 years in Colombia, the guerrilla, the paramilitaries, and the government entities, all fighting against each other for 50 years to take control over trade routes, to take control over land. Um, that in the absence of these cartels, of these systems, as soon as the demilitarization began, that process of actually reducing the number of arms, reducing the number of violence, 
that the elders from some of these lands were able to finally go back into that space and bring the medicine back to the youth. So this is relevant because there's two generations in between there. You've got this elder generation, which were already doing this work prior to a lot of the intervention from the cartels and the government. And you have a couple generations of people who had grew up, grown up in that context. My mother was one of those people who grew up in the colonial Western understanding of education in the world, which meant that you have a couple of generations of people who had assimilated successfully, which for their survival was a very good thing, it was necessary for them to assimilate to continue to stay alive. That's part of the paradox of assimilation. But the loss to that was that some of those traditional practices had not been carried because they were never taught. So this process of demilitarizing, of creating free space, of creating safe space once again in some of these ancestral lands meant that the elders could skip a couple of those generations and go to the youth, the young people, who interestingly are increasingly inspired by and aware of this wave of interest of psychedelic medicine and plant medicine in the global north who are suddenly interested in these plant medicines again even though their parents maybe even their grandparents weren't and we're seeing these political conflict cultural resolution ceremonies occurring in places in, in colombia and other countries to bring that back we're seeing it in brazil we're seeing it in colombia and what's happening is that there's this interesting process of restoring these traditions to the extent that we can, to the extent that they're available in that cultural context, but also through the lens of the matrix of the violence, of the oppression, of all the harm that had been caused over the, last, over the course of the last 50 years. That's just one case study, but I share that because this idea of psychedelics for peace building, it's like, it sounds a little bit outrageous, I think, if you're thinking of psychedelics in the traditional sense, like in the purely recreational, out there, personal transformation sense. But this idea that that space facilitates room for a dialogue, room for deep cultural regrounding and reshifting is actually quite ancient. It's actually quite old. So speaking of old, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well about restoration and like maybe some of the practical ways that restoration, restorative justice, these pieces can be linked between these ancestral conversations we're having, the matrix that we're currently in and where we're trying to go next. Sure. So raise your hand if you've heard or practiced restorative justice or something like that. Okay, some folks. Izzy um, alluded to this, but restorative justice is a broad term and it's a um, controversial term or a uh, a term that inherently raises some questions about what are we restoring to? Or, and, and was there anything whole in the first place to be restored? Um, and I thought about that this morning. So as a, as a spoiler alert, you know, what I'm really here to, to share, I think is the fact that we are now at a point in time in this country where our mainstream, um, most entrenched institutions um, are opening up to receive innovation and change um, in, I think, fundamental ways. And I think that's a really exciting thing. Um, the, the program I work for is with the AG's office in DC. The Attorney General's office. That's right, the Attorney General's <laughs> office. And we, we have a, a mandate, really. It, it started off as a project, and now, based on um, support from leaders, power players, uh, elected officials in the city, we have, we have a mandate to earnestly implement trauma-informed practices and interventions into our institutions. So, it's in its infancy. And, you know, we've had a legacy of, in my experience, change often happens, change sometimes happens in quantum leaps, okay? Your liberation story may have a sort of epiphany moment, particularly if psychedelics are involved. But for our societal level, community level changes, rarely do evolutionary steps happen all at once. There are there's incremental change and there are tipping points that occur 
uh, after a certain amount of incremental change is achieved. And at that point, you sometimes see fairly swift reform or evolution. But we're in the incremental phase now, and so things aren't perfect. But we have a legacy of, of, of a punitive system, a competitive, capitalistic, exploitative, punitive ethos that runs through our DNA as a society. Our society was not built to encourage relationships. The rules of the game that you were born into, that you are forced into, in most of your interactions with your fellow sisters and brothers, were not designed to facilitate relationship building. They were designed to facilitate the creation of wealth in the form of money and the creation of transactions. And so when we can tell the truth about those things, um, sometimes for the first time, it helps us see with clarity what needs to be done and how deep the work is. And so these are inc that, that, that's, that doesn't happen overnight. Re reaching reaching the, the utopia where there's no money and there's no prisons and there's no suffering from our, again, from our scriptural traditions, that may be never, but we see progress. So let me, let me return to our, our institutions. Everybody, you know, when I, we are, um, we are seeing 